Good morning, everybody. This is Kathy Bush, and welcome to the Dandelion Medical Webinar on the short and long-term impact of therapeutic positioning on pulmonary development, function, and morbidities. We're pleased to and he was recently recognized for his many clinical accomplishments by being awarded one of the inaugural Practice Pioneer Awards from the National Association of Neonatal Therapists. John currently serves as the Director of the Synactive Pediatrics Curriculum and Senior Faculty at the URSA Educational Institute in Sacramento, California. He resides in East Hampton, New York with his wife and continues to practice through metaphysical therapeutics, providing direct patient care and on-site clinical workshops to neonatal practice professionals around the U.S. John, thanks so much for joining us this morning, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Kathy. I'd like to thank Kathy Bush and Dandelion for putting this together and spurring me on, and Kathy Sally Randall for being our web magician, and my friend Mary Stanford, who is always uh, helping me out by my side. So our talk today is going to be the short-term and long-term impact of therapeutic positioning and pulmonary development, functioning in morbidities. The outline for today, we're going to look at some functional embryological morphology of the thoracic cage and respiratory system. We're going to discuss the role of effects of positioning and early movement on the preterm infant on lung function and chest mechanics. And we're also going to look at the end and discuss the impact of ventilator-induced lung injuries and specific therapeutic strategies, concepts, and interventions best used to prevent and minimize abnormal lung function. So um, here we go. Uh, everyone has a landscape by which we look at our babies and ourselves. Today, I'm hoping we're going to cover a lot of material through a lot of different um, professional um, scientific backgrounds, try and meld them together, and try and give everyone a different vantage point and perspective on what A, what you already know, B, what you may see in this uh, presentation that may spur your interest or connect some dots for you, and C, be able to take a look when you go back into your nurseries and um, take a look at that infant. Um, I'd like everyone to just sort of close their eyes right now, take a breath, and see the baby that you've been having trouble with, the baby that made you come to this webinar, the baby that brings you to work every day. And realize that I think when you close your eyes at the end of this hour, you will see this baby in a different light. So um, let's go on to the next slide. I always begin by saying there, uh, the miracle service we had when I started 38 years ago with infants, uh, the very low birth weight and extremely low birth weight infants really had huge mortality rates. No field of medicine, i.e. neonatology and perinatology, and no fields of nursing like neo neonatal nursing, and no fields of, of, of neonatal respiratory care have changed the outcome of their patients as radically in mortality rates as these people have over the last 30 years, and I've been lucky to be a witness to that. However, today we're not only talking about mortality, but we're talking about morbidity, pulmonary morbidity, synactive morbidities that we see in these patients all the time, especially those of us who follow up infants um, on a daily basis. In the fields of observation, chance favors the prepared mind. Today, I want to try and prepare your mind to see that baby in a different light. Nature's language is a language of relationships, biological form that consists of relationships, not parts. So we are gonna be constantly circling back, looking for synactive concepts and looking for biological form and function and how they fit together in the pulmonary system. Oops. We can't begin any developmental intervention talk on any level without talking about synactive theory and Dr. Heidi Lee's all. Um, she is one of my four mentors who I would like to thank. My other three in NICUs are Dr. Gretchen Lohan and Dr. Lauren Rex and um, Mr. Lino Cedros out of Sacramento. So when we, Dr. Alls put this theory out in 1992, it concatenated and brought all of the things we look at as developmental interventionists together under one roof. So how does the infant handle the experience of the world around it? They do so by continuous interorganism subsystem interactions while continuously interacting with their environment. This is the environment we supply to them. And she came up with this model, which we'll just take a look at it, but it is the foundation of each and every talk we give, no matter what we're talking about. 
from conception all the way up to about this 24th week where we begin to see babies being delivered, 22nd, 23rd week, there is a core of autonomic functional control. And this is what newborn intensive care units are built around, trying to get better autonomic control. You will see by the end of today that unless you are paying attention to the motor and the physical body of the system infant, its kinematics, its soft tissue, its bone joint tendons, you cannot really protect this autonomic system or you can protect it to a greater degree by positioning and handling and paying attention to this motor system. From these two core principles, state and attentional interactive structures begin to emerge in, in, a, in a, this tornadic or cyclonic kind of function. So again, everything we talk about with the human body that's either motor, sensory, or kinematics has direct impact on autonomics and vice versa. Once in full gravity, immediately after birth, the NICU infant carries with them a biotensegrity, a load though throughout its system and entire body that will affect all systems on a molecular to global synactic function. You cannot do one thing in the infant changing autonomic control or motor control without affecting this entire structure. Scary, huh? Okay, so today you're gonna to be the superheroes <laughs> <laughs> and you may already be the superheroes in your nursery. I'm sorry, I can't help laughing at this picture. So uh, this will be the last funny thing we see till the end. So uh, buckle your seatbelts and here we go. So which of the following physiological systems does respiration not affect in a synactive function? Well, it certainly has direct impact on cerebral spinal fluid systems and, eye, and intracranial pressures and cerebral blood flow. It definitely has a lot to do with lymphatics and vice versa. And we're gonna talk about the lymphatics of the lung today and how positioning may, may or may not be helping that infant uh, get rid of their um, fluid balances in their lungs or stabilize them. It has direct impact on, on, impact on cardiac output, systole and diastoles, but also oral motor, this oral digestive timing, function, and flow. Many of the people who are uh, tuned in today are involved with feeding. And to me, as I say in uh, NOMAS classes a couple of years ago, and I have the ability to talk again at Marjorie Mayor Palmer's NOMAS course in October in Orlando, feeding is respiration and respiration is feeding. We need to begin to set these babies up for respiratory success from the first moments we have them under our care. Not to all of a sudden decide at 34 and a half weeks, that the baby should be eating with a respiratory rate of 60 or 65 or 70 and poor quality, poor quality respiratory abilities in the chest. Subdiaphragmatic GI motility and mobility are directly uh, affected by respiratory capacities. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, that's a, a, an entire talk for an entire weekend. Pelvic and diaphragmatic floor and the ability to transit and even the elimination, which a lot of our babies with respiratory problems have terrible problems with. Uh, again, we'll pay a little lip service to that and give you some concepts. And lastly, the autonomic nervous system integration, vagal functions, and that limbic hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is the decider of whether babies approach or avoid us on, in their frontal cortical executive function uh, functions that they have. So it begins early and we try to take a look at a baby. Each baby is a snapshot in time. Uh, I have an old saying that I've used. It's, um, it takes a unique mind uh, to undertake the study of the obvious. And this is what we are. We're obviously looking at this baby right in front of us, but how do we categorize what we're looking at and how do we decide what to do best? If we don't pay attention here, this is what we get. Now, I tend to talk about a shallow and deep ecology. A shallow ecology, ecology means you're asking questions all the time of yourself, your caregiving, and this infant. Shallow ecology becomes very professional-centric. And as I say, we're all taught to be bigots in our professional schools, professional bigots. And I use this slide because when a neonatologist sees this slide, they're wondering, how's their cranium? What kind of bleed did they have? Well, how are their eyes? What are the retinal components looking at? The nurses tend to look at septums and skin care. And I'm being overly uh, generalizing here, but you're drawn to a certain part of this baby, and it's the part of the baby you know best. 
feeding therapists look at mouth and nose and they look at you know upper extremities and occupational therapists are really the experts in what upper extremities should be doing and maybe we look at belly we see who eh, zone of apposition where chest meets belly it's kind of a place where we all fall off the wagon and of course as myself a physical therapist my first place i look is here we have to begin to look at the whole infant all of us as a team to change the respiratory morbidities in a baby no one profession has all the answers so when i categorize the respiratory system as dr mortola did in the late 60s I would break it into four functional units, and each functional unit has a group of people who are their champions and experts. The first is gas exchange and alveoli functions. Well, the champions and experts obviously here, the people who diagnose, evaluate, and treat this are the neonatologists, the pulmonologists, the respiratory therapists, and the nurses who are tagged with caring for this infant when they are the sickest. The next group, Airways, bronchioles, bronchial tree, trachea. Well, again, the first group, they're really the champions and experts here. How do I diagnose a bronchial or tracheal problem? What's going on in here? How do I make it better? How do I deliver better care to this infant? Now, when we begin to look at the respiratory pump, you have to ask yourself in your nursery, who's the expert in number three? Do you have an expert in number three? Or are you all having different ideas that you need to come together and really analyze this respiratory pump? Because without the respiratory pump working correctly, you will not have functions of one and two any better than oxygen will always be necessary. And these are all the musculoskeletal components of respiration. And for the neurological dri <coughs> drivers, the sensory motor systems of this respiratory pump and how they feed back into this system. So I think this is the, maybe the first step for many of you, or many of you are teaching courses on respiratory pump, but we're going to be looking at three the effects on four and three, and the effects on one and two, direct effects. So let's get right to it. Movement and pneumocyte development. Now this is a constantly changing target over the last 20 years. I try to keep up on this, but I basically boiled it down to concepts that are still workable for people and still believable um, in many ways. And I think we'll go with this until we decide to change it more radically. But Type 1 pneumocytes are responsible for gas exchange in alveoli. They're unable to replicate as a, a lot of people would put this uh, forward as, as a postulate. Type 2 pneumocytes can proliferate and differentiate into type 2s to compensate for type 1 damage. That's a pretty good deal. So we as developmental or any person looking at pulmonology would want to facilitate the type 2 development at all possible. And type twos only differentiate if there are breathing movements. That seems to be across the board in any article you read. They are dependent on breathing movements, whether they're fetal or extra uterine. They begin embryogenesis around 24 weeks. That's again, can be sliding up and down of gestational age, but pretty much they have an embryogenesis. This baby is undergoing embryogenesis in every single system of its body under our care. So it behooves us to position them and bring them and place them in positions they can succeed for physiological equilibrium. They are responsible for production and secretion of surfactant. So anything that helps this system would be good. Unfortunately, and this is a very old slide, um, there are many things we are forced to do uh, early on to expand that floppy chest Part of it is putting high pressure systems into it. I'm even putting the neck in extension and having the infant supposedly in this old sniff position, which really functions only has a limited amount of applicability. At some point, this position becomes problematic for the respiratory pump. And we'll talk about this in a little while. So we may need to look at our positioning and see how we're positioning this rib cage and this zone of apposition of belly and upper extremities and head and neck to facilitate better movement through here. The zone of apposition is, is that area where chest meets rib cage. If the rib cage is relatively stiff due to either mechanical properties of the rib cage, rib cage itself or contraction of the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm will have an expanding influence on the rib cage. Now this expanding influence on the rib cage 
is not always a positive thing for a baby who is overextended like this. Now, initially, these rib cages are being built. We build them under our care. If you pay, place a baby in a position like this, they will have a position whereby they cannot develop normal pulmonary mechanics, period. It begins at the head and neck, and it begins with extension. Now, we have to intubate babies. Remember, we talked about no other field of medicine and nursing have really changed mortality, and they've done it by doing the right things at the right time. But unfortunately, every single intervention that generates more extension to an infant carries a morbidity, a biotensegrity load that we as developmental interventionists and parents and the, children's them, the children themselves have to try and work out over their whole entire lifespan. This on the left is an infant rib cage with this very splayed, easily misled diaphragm, easily overexpanded and stretched out to a point where it can't work. As a child develops into adulthood and even early on, the diaphragm morphology has to be enough so that it can change and develop so that this diaphragm can take on more normalized function. Form follows function always in the human body. Here we have uh, looking at inhalation and, ex and exhalation, more in an adult framework. But this rib cage, if it can't change shape and this diaphragm can't change shape correctly, then the function is going to be altered. And this beautiful picture here shows the diaphragm just doesn't come straight out here. It actually moves in a, in a caudal direction as it begins to dome and undome, especially even in the flat infant. And this hilum of the lung actually changes its position as babies breathe in and out. Unfortunately, we have to overinflate babies and bring their rib cages to a rigid place internally to allow for the physiology and the milieu of the pulmonary tissues to not collapse and kill the infant. But what that does is it sets this infant up for a different bony, rigid kinematic structure that they now have to deal with. But this movement here not only changes the airway position and facilitates inhalation and exhalation in the infant and, and, and uh, any human, so that really proper positioning actually has impact on how these airways and the flexibility of the airways themselves to respond to changing positions of the rib cage will affect the infant. Here, this is looking at actual axes of motion of the lungs. They are built with lobes. They slide in and out. They compress. They expand. And they do so on certain almost physiological tracks. And they do so because the diaphragm is working correctly. Now, in infants, their diaphragm is at a disadvantage. And we'll talk about that in a little while. So it behooves us to have these lungs actually moving. And once, it, once a lung gets injured and it has increased exudates and fluid balance problems, which BPD is, it's a matter of helping this lung and rib cage to move together to pump these fluids back towards the hilum. I'm not talking about secretions. I'm talking about the actual inflammatory exudates of the lung itself. And that's what good positioning allows to happen. Lung development and uh, fetal breathing movements, there are four parameters responsible, necessary for normal fetal or extra fetal lung development through pulmonary distensions. Adequate intrathoracic space. Well, in, 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 in a longer uh, uh, lecture, we can get into this a little more, but I would put it to you that they have inadequate thoracic space because the thoracic space is all generated into inhalation and not facilitated exhalation later on when the rib cage turns from a floppy, very compliant rib cage to a very hard, rigid rib cage. And that's what gives you your little huffer puffers at 34 weeks that you can't get off oxygen or caffeine. Adequate amounts of amniotic fluid. Well, that doesn't mean anything, but adequate amounts of movement to move fluid. Fluid in the lung, the lung has to be moving to move fluid. And in order for the lung to move, the rib cage has to be part of that equation. Normal fetal breathing movements are necessary for lung development and fetal movement, 
breathing movements, but now we have normal extrauterine breathing movements are normal to have a normal rib cage and normal movements. And that's what positioning should be doing. That's why you're positioning every minute of every hour of every day. And the normal balance of fluid volumes and pressures uh, in respect to the pulmonary and respiratory systems have to be in balance or else you have damage. And that's indeed what happens with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So a change in early structures and function can be magnified and disrupt consequent developmental events and decrease the individual's repertoire of ability during the course of their lifetime. This is adapted from Esther Thelen's work. And I can tell you that I don't know how many people in the audience have had more than 37 or 38 years of practice, but I am currently now working with one of my patients who had a what they called a paleo BPD event, an older BPD uh, baby, um, who is staring down uh, the barrels of um, lung transplants 33 years later, because maybe there were things we should have been doing with her back then that could have changed her course of events. So again, if you're going to do this, you must take it on yourself to include all the experts and all the champions for these four functional units so that baby reaps the benefit of all of your hemispheres put together. So this rib cage is a component of the respiratory system. Well, we, we already have that down. It is a structural and functional unit. Any change in its structure changes function. Any change in sensory input changes motor output and vice versa. Would you agree? Well, I think you'd have to agree when we look at how do babies generate a breath. They pre-select the breath and superimpose that breath on all the kinematics, all the neurologic input. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. So the only way you can change the next breath is to change the last breath to make it have better input and output. Thoracic musculature begins as sheets of muscles. They are not based on what they should be, but on how the fetus moves in utero. What fetal capabilities do you have at 23 weeks? Well, this is decided individually when you come out and you are now part of our world. We decide what your fetal capabilities are, and we decide how we're going to position you for the best possible way to succeed. Florence Nightingale said, always place your patient in a position to succeed. This is developmental interventions and positioning is not some bundling thing that you check off. Is the baby flexed? Are they aligned? Is that flexed aligned posture working for them? And is there a posture that needs to be built on before you push that baby into a better looking posture? And that's where NIDCAP observations come in. They tell you, the baby will tell you what they think of you first autonomically. And that's an old saying by Dr. Alt. So the fetus and baby builds what it's going to be by its movement repertoire, and that's why we position infants. This baby is a normal preterm infant, as per Dr. DeVries' book on uh, brain development. It's from the late 80s, or mid-90s, actually. This was a 24-weeker who is essentially exhibiting the normal posture of a preterm infant. Now, I'm not going to belabor this. You will continue to see this infant. But this child is going to have problems with a lot of things. Who wants to feed this baby? Nobody listening today wants to feed this baby unless you have a lot of really great skills. But we have to, this baby was built this way. And when we see an infant, remember I asked you to close your eyes. When you see that infant that you discharged with less than adequate results, the problem that lots of people have is that somebody tends to blame the baby. It's not the baby's fault. They are placed under our charge, and they are asking and pleading with us to put them together in the best possible way. And the most powerful way you can do that is by positioning, in my point, or skin-to-skin -skin care. Now, here we have an infant who looks pretty good, but if you take a quick look at it, we have lots of passive extension in the neck. We have a jaw that's remaining open. We have uh, two chest tubes that had to happen. And we probably have an overly tight diaper here, which is interrupting that abdominal rib cage movement pattern. And we're gonna look at that a little more. 
So in first place, and they have a shoulder that's very highly elevated, which is telling us we're still having pain here through this rib cage. The primary problem with this baby is how do I get this side of the rib cage eventually to work better isolated and in conjunction with the rest of the whole body? Respiration is a total body function. So when a baby tends to hold or fix in gravity, the price for a system act actively maintained in a situation of better stability and shorter time constant is obviously a higher work of breathing. The tighter a baby is, the harder it is for them to breathe. The more extended a baby is, the harder it is for them to breathe. Several intrinsic and neural mechanisms can effectively reduce the value of passive compliance and therefore reduce the operative time constant of the respiratory system. And Mortola wrote a lot about this in various journals and books, really looking at what happens when we position a rib cage and hold it there too long. What happens is this zone of apposition, if it's, the rib cage is relatively stiff due to either mechanical properties of the rib cage itself or contraction of the intercostal muscles, the diaphragms will have an expanding influence on the rib cage. Now we showed you that slide before, but I wanna show you exactly what that means. The action of the rib cage muscles depends on the relative orientation of their fibers and their axis of rotation. This is a slide I'd like you to look at the right side of the slide. It's showing you exactly in inhalation in an adult and exhalation, how the whole body from the pelvic floor and tensing of diaphragm and inspiration, the rib cage moving out of the way to allow uh, air into the lung, but in our BPD babies, it's not a matter of getting the air in. Sooner or later, that rib cage becomes tight in ins inhalation, and they have trouble expiring to make the lungs smaller. Now, infants are not like adults where this is a passive recoil mode. Uh, if you read uh, Dr. Davis's articles in uh, Clinics of Perinatology, it goes all the way back to November of 1987. He raised the concept of the laryngeal breaking being one of the protective mechanisms whereby this whole system has to be able to have adequate good feedback, adequate good flexibility to allow the infant to finally neurodevelopmentally gain control over appropriate amount of expiration so they don't have atelectotraumas in their lungs. And if you look at this lower left side, you see that every part of the body is involved. They're just looking at duodenum, how the position and the flexibility of the entire abdominal contents needs to be flexible enough not only to allow stomach, which is attached to diaphragm, and liver, which is huge hanging off the diaphragm, but all the abdominal contents and mesenteries have to be able to be mobile. And the more you curl a baby in flexion, the more mobility you allow in all of these structures, even down to the pelvic floor. So what happens in this rib cage is during exhalation, things have to stretch, things have to be able to close, and I'll show you a different uh, picture of this comparing it. And a lot of you have heard me speak about this transverse thoracic muscle. This is one of the neural controllers of the rib cage and one of the problems when we see grunting in infants. And this tends to work not only as a flexible movement, it tends to overly stabilize the overinflated chest. This begins at the head and neck. And here we see if we change the posture of the head and neck, anterior flexion towards the nose bending or backwards towards the occiput, just the muscles that attach and ligaments from the cranium and upper cervical spine drag this entire upper quadrant, clavicle, first and second ribs, and scapulas upwards to create an inspired chest wall. And we'll take a look at this in a couple of slides. So paying attention to cervical spine is going to have just as much impact on the rib cage as paying attention to the lower extremity when we position correctly and allowing a baby not to be stuck in a position or not to be restrained in a position, but allowing babies micro movements that they would be doing in, in their fetal environment uh, uh, to reposition themselves for comfort and function. This baby was held and pinned by gravity, but we don't wanna take it, something that allows the infant no movement at all, no individuality, and we have to assess this baby likes to move for some reason more on its right side than its left side. So let's do this. Or this baby breathes a little better half turn supine. Or this baby likes prone, but only for about 35 minutes. And then we have to change his position and not leave him there for two hours. 
So when a system is stressed, it adapts by ultimately changing shape to assist at all levels with the balance and flow of resources and energies first. That's synactive theory, that physiology wins all the time. If there's a problem in movement, it will drag physiology down. Movement should be helping physiology stabilize. And if an infant is placed in, in a stress situation where rigid, incorrect, or ineffective compensatory movements are selected or dictated, and a lot of times we select an ineffective position, we dictate that the infant stay in that position too long, then what we're having is maladaptation in all areas of its life processes. Negative somatic synergies will occur. Here's that lung again. Here's what we were talking about, about the cervical spine and the attachments superior to the clavicle and first rib influencing, and as the head and spine go into extension, it pulls this rib cage forward. This rib cage, actually, and this is an adult rib cage, as you can see with cassettes. Um, I just want to articulate, no pun intended, that someone once said in an infant, there are about 126 different articulations, joint bone, we use the word bone loosely, articulations and fascial articulations that have to work correctly for one normal breath to occur. And I'm asking and demanding people to be able to look at this in an individualized way, a constantly changing, flexible, individualized way of facilitating normalized movement in this rib cage. And even upper ribs in infants and lower ribs work differently. And when we look at the neural controllers, we'll see one is generated by mostly phrenic and the other is generated mostly and, and controlled by other areas in the cortex, not cortex, uh, pneumostatic uh, centers. So we'll look at that later. But again, this has to happen. It happens in this plane and it happens in all three planes. So the distinctive shape of the chest allows or restricts compliance and deformation ability of the infant and pediatric chest wall. This in turn causes adaptation by the respiratory controller to maintain optimal respiratory functions. This is from Hershon in uh, Beckerman's book, uh, Respiratory Control Disorders in Infants and Children. It's an older book, but it has absolutely exquisite introductory chapters on mechanics and function. And it might be something you wanna look at and uh, it will resonate with you. So this stress of not being able to breathe is just one area where stress is the most individualized pathogen in the NICU. And basically, if an infant isn't respiring correctly, every other synactive system in their body is going to be degraded by that stress sooner or later. And it's an individualized. Some develop problems in their gut. Some develop, develop problems in their brain. Some develop problems with their aerodigestive system. Some develop problems with their movement pa parameters or E, all of the above. So when we position and we do it in an individualized, constantly changing, flexible format, the most damaging phrase in clinical care to me is it's always been done that way. So today I'm asking people to sort of put aside their, their uh, preferences and predilections and to kind of take a different look and saying, yeah, okay, how can I reconnect with this infant and really look at this respiratory system and see what my positioning is doing in a positive or negative way. This is a look, this ability for a normal breath and the place where a baby puts their functional residual capacity. And if you look on this scale, this is a normal breath for an infant, let's say. Um, your huffy, puffy babies and poor feeders, they're up here. Their chest can't relax their total lung volume is actually probably higher and it stays that way, it doesn't change. So that this functional residual capacity early on is in a way, one of the things that kills these infants. So we over have to put in nasal prong CPAP, we have to put positive ventilation, we have to get their lungs overextended and hold them there. But during this period of time, the rib cage and abdomen are changing shape either for the better or the worse. And that's what positioning decides. If you look at this chest wall mechanics, I'm just going to show you, this is where an infant chest wall is. It's quite a bit different than an adult. It's a lot um, broader in some ways. And when the diaphragm pulls at a different angle, it tends to be delivered, it is very inefficient. As an adult, when the morphology of the rib cage changes, the head would be up here, 
it's a much more functional unit. The diaphragm is better at pulling. And this is what uh, I know that I hope every physical therapist got. It's called the Blix curve, B-L-I-X. Each muscle in the body has an optimal place where it pulls with the least amount of stress on it, physiological and kinematic stresses. And babies are very inefficient. Then the more this chest becomes inspired, the harder it is for that diaphragm to do its job. And we know that the diaphragm in an infant is very easily fatigable. It has much less um, uh, white fibers than an adult diaphragm does. So they need our help. I'm sorry for this, but this was put in by my friend Mary Stanford today on a last minute basis. I found this in the book. I thought it was another book. It's actually in Campbell's book on respiration. But this is looking at a chest wall. The fetus, because it's in an, it's in an environment, has a pretty circular chest. The term infant, and it gets a little bit more elongated. But when you look at our babies, and you'll see this baby again that I showed you, their chests are not cylindrical at all. They're flat in the back. And especially, let's talk about, we have to put babies back to sleep. It's saving lives. The optimal question is, how soon or when do you put these babies back to sleep? And again, every intervention, whether it's intubation or back to sleep, if it changes the neuromotor and changes the kinematics of the rib cage, which it does, it carries a load. And these babies are having to remediate it, sometimes with months and sometimes with years of occupational, physical, and speech therapy on top of whatever pulmonary morbidity they have. So how do we make this and serve many masters by creating a better morphology of the rib cage, even with back to sleep? Again, the answer is appropriate positioning. This is an inspiration and you look and see how many muscles have to elongate and stretch where they are, pec minors, all the capital muscles here, the diaphragm, even the way the abdomen works in an infant, has to be flexible, it has to be able to expand and contract. And in expiration, and especially when you have bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the key to lymphatic movement, the key to getting a wet lung to turn into a dry lung, to get the huffy, puffy, overinflated baby, is to help the infant make the chest A, smaller, and B, cut down their apical breathing and create better basal breathing. And that's what the flex posture will do for you. Not only that, but again, this is the fourth functional unit. And uh, I hope you can see this, but this is uh, from Dr. Netter's book many, many years ago, looking at the uh, pneumotaxic centers and uh, ap apneuistic centers. I can't even pronounce that. Looking at their function going up into cerebral cortex, limbic HPA axis system, and coordinating if I'm breathing well my cerebral cortex actually gets perfused differently than if I'm not, and I use my areas of my brain differently. And that's to a lot of the work of Dr. Alls and Heidi Alls, and those of you who've heard me speak on that, um, how pulmonary congestion and stress in the infant's somatic system changes the way babies are able to uh, execute executive functions. And we see this as physical, occupational, and speech therapists all the time. And if you're looking, this, uh, this entire center where we're blending chemoreceptors and stretch receptors of lungs and stretch receptors of the intercostals and stretch receptors of the diaphragm, it's all working as a functional unit. And that's what helps this infant select this breath. A tight extended rib cage is going to bring in a whole different amount of increased CO2 because they can't expire the CO2, which is going to try and change their rib cage to take a bigger breath in or breathe out if they can. But if their rib cage is locked, as we've seen, they'll be unable to do it. So the neural controller may be willing to change, but the exterior container of that respiratory system um, may not be able to change. So how do we change it? Well, one good way to do it is to look, the upper extremities really form a web for respiration. If we can change upper extremity postures to create a more flexed, quiet uh, posture that facilitates hand to mouth, hand to face, uh, hand clasping, uh, keeping the hands anterior, we begin to look at 
they change respiratory efforts and movements. They change pulmonary blood flow. They change cervical spine mechanics. They change jaw and sucking patterns in babies. They change in airway hyoid functioning. And don't forget this hyoid attaches to the cranium, ribs, and clavicle and sternum anteriorly and the cranium to the scapula posteriorly. So what does that mean? Let's take a look. Anteriorly, it means when we place a baby prone, we're giving them ventral input. We're actually physically closing this rib cage and allowing them to breathe less apically if their cervical spine and head and neck are positioned and upper extremities are brought into flexion. We're taking away the apical breathing component and creating a better basilar diaphragmatic breath for these infants and you'll see it, the posterior view actually is here. What happens is we allow this area of the lower part of the infant to really uh, dome and begin to change its morphological shape uh, if they're positioned correctly in flexion. And we drag these scapulas, we place them down. We don't let the babies elevate their shoulders. We keep this scapula down, we keep the hands in front of them. And lastly, what happens is all the, the entire inferior aspect of this diaphragm has organs hanging from it. So we have a liver that accounts for 20% of the mass of the infant. We have a stomach that changes shape every three hours radically, especially if we're using volume-driven feeding. This diaphragm not only has to deal with the shapes around it and what's happening underneath it, but things physically attached to it, like colon and mesenteries. So uh, positioning takes the load off the diaphragm here as well. And if you look at this infant, you can see not only the apical breathing pattern that they're stuck with because their extremities are loud and flayed out and elevated. There's a rotation of the cranium to one side, which is keeping one side from moving uh, correctly and making the infant breathe more radically with one side than the other. You're having this zone of apposition and these visceral components, because the pelvic floor is so tight, these abdominal contents and lower pelvic contents can't move down into the pelvis and back up with each breath. They're stuck and they're being forced out anteriorly. So controlling upper extremities as best you can, as early as you can, even with lines and all kinds of paraphernalia and intubation, is still something you wanna do and leaving a loose diaper here, not a tight diaper, a loose diaper where the infant can do diffuse squirming and move side to side and bring their legs up in facilitated flexion and allow their rib cage to dome underneath below. And you'll still see how tight this anterior rib cage is gonna be with this baby, but the jaw is closed and the baby seems to be tolerating it pretty well. Could we position this baby better? Yes. Now, since we're talking about positioning, there is no one positional system that fixes everything. There is no one treatment that fixes everything. And a lot of times patient, um, people will tell me, well, I'm only allowed to buy this one positioner. Well, that one positioner has its total amazing strengths and those babies who need that need that. And there are other positioning systems who allow other things to happen for other individual needs for that baby. To be stuck with one positioning system may or may not be servicing your babies and their pulmonary systems to the best ability. Sometimes you can just do it with rolls and towels, but there's always a better way to do it. So when we talk about chronic lung disease, does anyone really know what time it is? The single fundamental shortcomings of BPD care, and remember Frank Larry in his book said there was a neo and a paleo, and if there are any neonatologists listening, I ask them all the time, what do these two terms mean to you when you talk about BPD? Because it means many different things to many different people. But the fundamental shortcoming of BPD care is that we never take note on how and where the infant's chest compliance affects the respiratory process. Do we get our hands on these babies? Do we feel their ribs? Do we see what different positions make them better or worse? Do we look at the quality? You know, science, if you think, and I don't care what initials you have after your name, if you think that you are only a scientist, art plays a lot in the way you look at infants and their uh, individuality and their individual capability. We are both artists and scientists when we deal with the human body. So how do we account for this chest wall compliance? Do we monitor it? 
and do we do uh, appropriate positioning and part of our developmental care, or do we just treat every baby the same and cookie cut them in the same posture and position? The change between a highly compliant chest wall and low compliance will occur overnight, over days, over weeks, but it will occur. That floppy chest that you've had to overinflate now becomes a stiff, rigid rib cage incapable of the micro movements those lungs need to protect themselves in their lymphatic. But if you're not evaluating it and treating it, all your respiratory care by definition will at best be maladaptive and at worst complete. And when we look at retractions, I don't look at just retractions. I use these areas to say, are each areas in this infant working correctly? Are they working together in their timing and their function? If I change the posture of an upper extremity or give more flexion or more lateral side bending, do I change the way this entire structure works? And it, guess what? It takes time and it takes a lot to observe this. Uh, and you have to spend the time watching. I actually was lucky enough to be part of uh, Columbia Presbyterian Babies Hospital um, uh, when I first began. And I got to uh, see Dr. Jen Wong and John Driscoll's babies who were arguably some of the best uh, neonatologists giving pulmonary care according to their statistics in the world at that time. And I would watch Dr. Wong watch infants and he taught me how to stand by the bed and watch. And people, one nurse said to me, you guys are like vultures. And you know, as Yogi Berra said, you can learn a lot just by watching. So with BPD comes a ventilated induced lung injury. And I think that the crux of this talk is that by changing positions and finding optimal positions for that pulmonary respiratory system, that we can change the course of the amount of injury we generate to these babies by our caregiving. The first is volume trauma. It consists uh, of damage caused by over distension. And we saw that an extended infant has an overextended chest wall. Do these babies have less Value trauma, when we slowly meter in their flexion into their chest and wall, I do believe they do. Atelectotrauma is a, a result of recruitment and collapse. This is a neurogenerator as well as a, a, uh, a micro problem where the levels of end expiratory pressure uh, really can change the entire uh, process of how this baby is able to breathe in and out. And do we modify our positioning to, uh, to reflect the changes we're making in these expiratory pressures. And barotrauma, that any mechanical ventilation related insult that induces the release of lung cytokines or inflammatory mediators. This, it, we have to give them this barotrauma to a degree because they're 23 weeks and they're coming out and breathing air and they're gonna generate lung cytokines and inflammatory mediators, but how do we help them get rid of that? So the three mechanisms you have to account for in developmental caregiving, is preterm infants may not be developmentally prepared to protect their lungs from potential injury. And that's from Bank Valeria's book in 2007, eight and nine. So how do we accomplish this? Anyone? <laughs> well, everyone can accomplish it by really trying to protect this infant's lungs through a more phasing of expiration and inspiration in developmental caregiving and position. So yes, we have the power to change all of these things. And we do this in essence, in every posture and every position we, we facilitate and do all of our handle. And I'm just gonna go back two slides because what happens is those early movements we talked about are the movements. And if you look at Stallman's original articles in 68, and I thought we had a picture of this, but I, we may have it coming up, but I don't know. Should have already been here. Um, the lymphatics of the lung, there are no lymph nodes in the lung. It is up to the movements, the macro and micro movements of the lungs are linked inextricably. That, that compression and breathing movements and inspiration and expiration pump the lymphatics of the lung and take that inflammatory exudate and move it into the hilum of the lung where the baby can process it better. Again, it's not secretions. It's the actual fluid in the, in, in the spaces that the lymphatics have to deal with. And that was uh, first brought out by Stallman in his original article and Lures in their original article in 1968. 
So uh, I will have that reference for you when we put the handouts together and slide if we don't come across it. So yes, this is a, a terribly, horribly cute baby, isn't it? But you know, what are we doing? What are we doing when we look into these eyes and we place these babies in positions to succeed, whether it's skin to skin or before skin to skin or after skin to skin. And we begin to see that little changes in upper extremity here that's being retracted and pulling this baby's actually head and neck and jaw laterally and creating a little more stress into this uh, oral motor and upper cervical spine. Could this baby be a little more flex? Does it want to be a little more flex? Have some, has someone evaluated exactly the best positions for this infant? I don't think this is it. We see infants generate a lot of mid-cap based movements. And those of you who are familiar with mid-cap, um, I, I really think you're going to be giving a better level of care all around. Those of you who have been introduced in NIDCAP and maybe need to reintroduce yourself to NIDCAP, uh, I would invite you to get back on the uh, NIDCAP Federation International website and see what they're doing in your neighborhood. I think there'll be some courses being generated over the next few years. There are things that babies will do even with their trunk and their core, sitting on air, tremors, shaking, startles. Every one of these carry with it a respiratory change so the less startles and tremors and twitches we see, the more quiet the baby is and can assemble decent sleep architecture. And we didn't even talk about sleep architecture today as a function of positioning. But suffice it to say, better positioning that leads to a better respiratory outcome and ability will give you better sleep. As long as your unit is watching, minding its P's and Q's with lights and noise and make sure you throw the radios out the window. And I think you'll have babies who can sleep better. Finger splays, tongue, grimacing, face, a baby here. What is this baby doing right now? Are they holding their breath? Most probably they're going through a little valsalva, holding their breath uh, and finger splaying. And then this finger splay either becomes a hand to face maneuver or it generates into a stretch drown where the baby will start to shake and their respiratory system is now completely um, changed and you have to really regenerate it and put them back together. I can tell you what kind of pulmonary care you're giving. When you go into a nursery and you hear a baby crying for any reason, crying devastates normal respiratory functions. It creates a totally different neuromotor milieu. So the more crying your infants do, the more uncomfortable they are, the more stressed they are, the more you've increased their neural control uh, problems in their rib cage. So grimacing, holding breath, you see this, just all these little things you can see. And if you do a mid-cap based concept, you're constantly looking for these respiratory things. Keep in mind, every burp, every gag, every retch, every vomit, every yawn, every sneeze, even though they're all normal things that babies will do, if they're in excess or they're poorly timed, in the infant's repertoire that day, it changes the neurophysiological abilities of their respiratory systems, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. So you're constantly looking for these avoidance postures and how you can facilitate better movement. You and I are the people who build these babies. One person with courage and foresight in a nursery can really change the entire landscape and viewing of these infants. Keep in mind that respiration is something we build into this system. We have to protect it to the best of its abilities, and we have to put this infant in a position to succeed. Each and every minute of every day, of every week, of every month, they're in our nursery. So I think we'll stop and take some questions now, and um, we will send handouts um, in the, in the emails, and then I think by tomorrow. So I think I'm going to stop right here. Great. John, thank you so much. That was, that was really amazing. Um, we're going to open up for questions for about five minutes. <clears throat> sure. If you look in the chat box on your left, if you uh, maximize your screen, try to minimize it. And we've got a first question already. What can NICU parents do to intervene on their baby's behalf if they see these signs of distress or are concerned about their positioning? Oh, okay. Um, the first we would say is I think they need to talk to their nurse 
and um, that would be the first person to look at. I would ask maybe this nurse um, has MidCap training. Maybe they have never heard of it before. I think if you are someone on the developmental team and you're giving the NIDCAP signs and overloads or looking at uh, an extended babies, you need to you need to kind of tread lightly, but tread directly. You know, your compassion must not falter. You must keep your compassion um, on a level that uh, that really that you use your concentration and your awareness to generate who is the person that can help me help this this uh, parent. And it never hurts to educate the parents because they become the agents of change ultimately in every nursery. It's not you or I. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's an individual based concept. But as Heidi Alls would say, Dr. Alls would say, find the agents of stress in your nursery and change them and try find the people who you have uh, things in common with. Um, there's a beautiful quote that says, we're all angels with just one wing. We can only fly by embracing each other. Um, so find out the other people who share your concepts and really had a parent group and ask the parents to look into things. I, I won't tell you what my usual, um, I would just have the parents complain directly to the people in charge and say, I want a better caregiving as per this for my infant. Sometimes that's what you have to do. Next question. Next question, how early are OTPT and speech consulted in your NICU, or should they be cons be consulted in any NICU? Well, if we look at the four functional units like we looked at, everybody has a place at the table. And when I first started, people said, oh, you're just a PT, you just do muscles and joints. But what we just talked about today is, hey, you know, you guys are the experts in one and two. I might be the experts in three and part of four. Why don't we put our heads together from day one, from minute one, and see if we can't figure out a way to get these babies. Doesn't mean I'm gonna be handling the baby or twisting or turning them, but be allowed to be part of the team, come in and look and say, okay, I understand you have to nasally intubate this baby. I understand that this baby needs to be extended in life. It's going to mean I wanna be looking at this rib cage. I wanna be giving you concepts and ideas. I want to be able to give you input to change this baby because you're the experts in how these lungs are working. But basically, if you're a therapist, we are the experts in what happens later on. We're asked to change the morbidities when they leave that nursery. And so bring that knowledge of what you see on the outside, especially in your follow-up, back into the nursery. Um, it took me 17 years where I finally got our nurses in our hospital. They were paid to go to the developmental follow-up clinic and follow their babies up. And they would be shocked at how well they were doing. They were like, oh my gosh. And you'd say, you know why this child is sitting up and rolling over? Because when I we use this positioning system and we really did a great job on it, this baby looks good because you helped her build herself and put herself together way back at 23 weeks. And they were stunned by it. And we as therapists see that every day. So maybe you need to get um, your people involved to really see the amazing potential they have to change and have these babies look good. So I hope that answers okay. the question. But I, I like to see people involved right away. Next question. When a blood gas is critically high with CO2, any positioning recommend, recommendations you would have? Well, if it's critically high, and I'm going to say that maybe this baby does, I'm hoping this baby has something more chronic like BPD rather than some other ongoing acute problem that could be related to cardiac problems. But you'll find that this baby, this I have seen four infants with poor O2s and high CO2s with chronic lungs, four in 38 years who did not benefit from relaxing their cervical spine, generating more flexion, bringing their shoulders down, getting their rib cage relaxed, getting more flexion in their low extremities. I've seen four of the children who did not tolerate it physiologically. All four of them had severe ADD, and two of the four of them had acute, had, uh, acute lymphosatic, um, had ALL, leukemia. So all I'm saying is, um, later on they generated this. Um, it may be part of their neural system, but try to get them relaxed into flexion, try and get them to relax, let the babies move the way they're supposed to move, Get them more flexed and relaxed, and you will see 
their respiratory rate will drop by 10 a minute, their pink up, and you'll look and see their PO2s getting higher. It's hard to have better looking PO2s as your CO2 is going up. So try that. And many of you have seen, you know people. Let me just say this. I'm not the only expert in this. There are people like Jane Sweeney, who's a physical therapist, and Kathy Smith, who's a physical therapist, um, who are training people, and Colleen Coulter. These people are physical therapists I know. Uh, there were many OTs. Find an expert. Find a godmother. Uh, Mary Massery is doing a lot of work in follow-up. You know, she's been doing it for decades on respiratory care. She's a physical therapist and, and, and does respiratory things. We at the Ursa Institute, uh, Educational Institute, will be doing two and a half day NICU respiratory um, courses starting in uh, June of 2016 at uh, Children's Specialized Hospital in uh, Loverwood Johnson, and we'll be offering it again in Sacramento. That may be something you want to include uh, with, but find the people who are publishing, find the people who teach this, and 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 hook up with them. John, I, I was just, just going to ask. Oh, sorry, Kathy. I was just going to say the um, one of the questions was about a respiratory course. So would you maybe, when you have that, we could um, post it on your resource page in the future. Absolutely, we'll have it together. We have the dates and. And I, I, like I said, there are many people teaching this in many, many variations. Ours is focusing on manual therapies and looking at the synactivity of manual therapies in the NICU. So, Fantastic. yes, we will do that. Any other questions? Yes. I, I what, look, re what resources are available for specific positioning? Oh, you know, I have... <laughs> The best one that I've seen, and I'm sorry, I, I wanted to include a picture in this and I just forgot, uh, if you have your pen and pencil, there's a really good book out by Dana Fern, F-E-R-N, she's an OT, and it's called A Neurodevelopmental Care Guide to Positioning and Handling. It really, uh, it really allows you to travel through different positioning systems. It allows you to look and see what people are making mistakes. It's almost a good quiz to blow the pictures up and show them to your people and say, well, what would you change? What do you like in this picture? What don't you like? And a nurse will have a different uh, correct answer than a PT and a, and a doc will have a different one than a feeding therapist. So um, that's a really good little book to look at. Um, and I think she's coming out with a second edition soon, I hope. So this and maybe what? goes hand in hand with that question is someone's asking about when do you recommend removing positioning devices and also how do OTs, PTs help to consult on that transition to safe sleep? Right. They have to be able to, they have to consult. And I should have maybe hammered this home a little more, but we're, we probably will do something else on safe sleep and, and skin to skin as being a continuum. Uh, and positioning being the bridge that bridges them together. Um, what we have to put babies in the back to sleep posture. I worked with a really great uh, doctor at Winnie Palmer in Orlando, Florida. Her name, his name is uh, Tony uh, Orsini, and he was very big in back to sleep. I mean, when you consider that again, what they've done with back to sleep has cut the mortality again out of an enormous amount and dropped it to unprecedented points for SIDS. But however, if you speak to any physical or occupational speech therapist, we'll tell you the morbidity has gone way up. The cranial asymmetries, the, 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 the delays in milestones, the qualitative changes in movement patterns are, are devastating to some children. So the idea is this is something you move towards. And maybe what you do is you do your back to sleep, but now when you have babies who are awake or you can watch them, you position them sideline, you show parents how to handle them gently, you get them, the positioner then becomes something that you tune for each infant. And this is a question that we all have to answer. And um, I think that when you look at NANT, uh, National Association for Neonatal Therapists, um, they're gonna have a lot of answers in the future. Okay, in the prone position, is it better to elevate the thorax in order to, one, not overextend the neck, and two, create a more 90-degree angle at the hips? Okay, that's a good question. I wish I had a picture of it. Um, it all matters on every, 
Heidi Lee's all says everything matters. So if you have an infant who's had a grade one bleed or two or three, the question is, is if you raise their hips and pelvis higher than their head, you're going to have a problem with decreasing or changing cerebral spinal blood flow as well as cerebral blood flow. So you wouldn't be pulling the pelvis up above the head, especially in a preterm infant, uh, really of any age, if you can do it, uh, even during diaper change. Um, that's been shown to really stress normal full-term infants. And it does it for many reasons. So I would, uh, what I would tell you to do is to, if it's a young infant and has had a bleed or not, or is at risk for a bleed, I would keep their gravitational, their pelvis and their head uh, in the same gravitational plane. Does that mean, I hope it makes sense to you. Um, you can always decrease the tightness of the diaper. You can always, if you can decrease the flexion in the, in the upper extreme, um, in the neck and the cervical spine, decrease the extension in the cervical spine. If they're not intubated, do that anytime you can. So, um, if, uh, you know, hopefully next time we'll have more pictures or a few videos. So, yes, you always want to be moving towards flexion and out of extension. Okay. Any next question? So quite a few. Um, uh, do you have any pictures or diagrams of best positioning? Would you recommend Dana's book for that? Um, again, the positioning and handling book. Um, I know that Kathy had sent me a number of pictures of her positioning product. I believe that each positioning system should have good position, uh, uh, pictures of position and posture. Um, we went through quite a few permutations of this talk in the last five hours today. And I think some of the pictures, um, there were a few, but they're not here now. So um, I will certainly have them if I do it uh, anything ever again for you guys and, <laughs> and we'll have more. But yeah, you, that's a very basic question. Um, and I think you need to go to a basic concept. I would look at the NIDCAP Federation International and see what they have on positioning. Um, uh, I'm just again, Dan, Dana's book is another good resource that um, yeah. we would also recommend. Here's yeah. another question. You spoke about the effect of positioning for sleep, but what effect does waking infants up for care have on effective positioning? Well, those of you who heard me speak, there's an entire neuroembryological transition from wake to sleep. I will just say this, that there are people who've done studies that show that in order for an infant to reach REM sleep, its chest wall has to be relaxed. And that REM sleep occurs, you want to make sure that babies have enough active sleep. And I think this is what the problem is, is when we pin babies into one position, that active sleep phase is part of their REM sleep. And REM sleep is part of when the growth is exuded and reaches its peak. So when we hold the baby in a tightly contained position, hour after hour, and not leaving them the individuality for small wiggles and small changes and micro movements in their body, um, I think we actually influence uh, the whole sleep architecture of an infant. When you wake a baby up, uh, you should be only wake a baby up for a really good reason. And it should be having something to do with either interacting with its mother or feeding. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, babies have to be awake to, to eat. Just remember that. So I'm, I, the question, I don't, I don't get the whole question, but I'm just saying there are many ways to wake a baby. Wake a baby, wake a baby the way you would like to be woken up. And last so, question. Um, can you speak on neonatal massage, and have you seen it assist the baby's positioning and or respirations? Okay. Neonatal massage is an intervention, and all interventions carry with it, no matter how well-intentioned, can carry with it an undue load to the synactive systems. In other words, you have to be constantly monitoring, is this too much for this baby? Have I changed their respiratory rate? Has it accelerated? Is their PO2 dropping? Is their color changing? If so, stop the massage. 
or go to a different place or let the baby recover. Just don't press. I've seen people blow infants away by well-intentioned massage that begins at their feet and goes all the way to their head without looking at any of their cues, physical, motoric, or visceral uh, avoidance and approach cues. And massage being done without a mid-cap based format is, is more often not a good thing than a good thing. Great. Um, there are some specific product questions, and we'll try to pull those off um, and answer them separately. For, in, for CE purposes, we can't do any specific product um, discussion or endorsements or not endorsements, so we'll try to get to that um, later. We have a comment from someone that says, this is a great presentation. Thank all the team for it. Hope there will be a part two with more videos. And I uh, can't agree more. I hope we will be able to have John back again. He has amazing information, and we could pull apart different systems and look at other positioning needs. So. Again, this webinar was brought to you by Dandelion Medical, and we are just thrilled that we had someone with as much expertise as John did today to impart his information to all of you. Just I do want to mention that we do have several Dandelion products that will help provide therapeutic positioning for babies with pulmonary issues. Um, we have two new products, a Rue 2 and a Dandel Wrap Stretch. that are made from a high-performance stretchy fabric. Um, and that really helps the baby to, to move and be able to be positioned um, in a way that will help to support the respiratory system. If you're interested in receiving more information or receiving a sample of either of these products, you can indicate your interest in the evaluation form. Sorry, now, in order to receive CE, you'll need to fill out the webinar evaluation. In the chat area, you can uh, click on the evaluation link or once we're finished, you'll be immediately redirected to the evaluation form if your firewall allows. At the end of the evaluation form, you'll receive a link to the CE certificate. If you don't have time to fill out the evaluation right now or your hospital has blocked access, you'll receive an email either later this afternoon or over the weekend with a link to the evaluation as well as a link to the recording and a PDF of John's slides. If you're viewing as a group, you must each log into the evaluation form in order to get the CE. So I know we have a lot of groups watching. If you want the CE, um, just each of you should write that link down or follow it um, from the, the chat box and fill out the information yourself. Now, uh, we have 25 uh, webinars that have been pre-recorded, as this one has been recorded as well. Please visit the Dandelion Medical website for future webinars and also links to all the, the previous ones. John, thanks again. I don't know. It sounded like you had a few parting words to you wanted to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Please. Thank you, everyone. Um, the road to becoming a, a, an impeccable clinician begins with education, and that no matter how good your intuition is, as my uh, instructor says, your intuition is always improved by education. So thank you, both Kathy's, for allowing me to poison minds once again. Well, thank you. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we hope, John, that we'll have you back again. Thanks. Thanks, Gabby.